It's a fishing trip. Some here have been there. So I reached out to get uh, connected to the government of Canada and ended up with the Consul General for New England, Dave Allward, visiting us during our gathering, saying a few words, and expanding the relationship between the United States and Canada. That's one piece. The second piece is, and I'm sure there are some here who have been to Normandy, and if you go to Normandy, you will, as, a, as an American, most visitors go to Normandy, and what do they do? They go to the American cemetery, they spend a day, maybe two, and I've done that in the past, but in an extended trip to Normandy, uh, Christine and I actually decided we wanted to visit and walk all the beaches. And I would encourage anyone who's going for a celebration, if they're going this year, if they go at any other time, to take the extra couple of days and see the entire picture of Normandy. And one of those beaches is Canadian. There's a monument on the beach, just like we had in the American armed forces, Navajos who were able to communicate so that the enemy couldn't understand the communication. And there was, there's a monument to the Eskimos who were Canadians who lost their lives in the invasion of Normandy on the Canadian beach site. So I thought about that and I said, you know, we're having lots of issues, and they are political, and some people in this room may be upset with me because they'll say, you're being political. I'm not being political. The way I see it, the United States has a 4,000-mile peaceful border. Think about that. And an enduring, trusted relationship with our neighbor to the north. So, with the help of David Allward and the government connections to Canada, I have a new best friend. <laughs> and and let, me, let me do this. So we, we decided we would spend a little time and have a conversation, and we'll have 100 people listen to us. Susan is a consul general from Canada. She's in Miami. That's where you're based, I think. Yeah. She is uh, a, an experienced diplomat for her government. She is a seasoned, uh, prestigious history because before being consul general, she was in the economics ministry, the embassy, wasn't it the embassy? Um, that was part of it. Part that of it. was a yeah. part of the Foreign Service experience. Yeah. Before I joined the Foreign Service, I was in the, uh, I taught at the PDP College. Uh, tell us for two, three minutes about you. Um, can you hear me well enough? Is there a, yeah. If I need this, is that better? Yeah. So, um, little bit about myself. I'm first generation Canadian, but three times Mayflower on my mother's side. So I have very deep American roots, which has given me the ability to watch the relationship from both sides all my life. And um, I uh, joined the Foreign Service as a trade officer, which we can do in our Foreign Service. And my experience in the Foreign Service has either been in trade or economic or as a head of mission, which is what I am, as one of the 12 consuls general for Canada in the United States. The 12 of us plus the ambassador are the heads of mission for Canada in the US. And we work as a network, as you've been pointing out. Um, my background, in, um, I have an MBA. I wanted to live overseas, but as the daughter of immigrants, I didn't want to immigrate, so that's how I got into a job 
where I could live abroad and not immigrate, because I can always go back home. And um, I uh, am lucky to be in Florida because I have a background, two postings in Latin America, and as you know, in Miami, I'm in Latin America. And um, plus I speak now, thanks to the Foreign Service, Spanish and French, both with a Toronto accent and a little bit of color from my past assignments. And uh, I spend my time here in Florida. This is my third year where we're responsible for Florida, Puerto Rico, and USVI, which obviously means most of our time is in Florida. Introducing Canada to people in Florida, including Canadians, because most people have no idea about Canada's footprint here in Florida. And it always seems to me a good part to, a good place to start the conversation. Of course, I don't usually get an introduction quite as wonderful as the one I've already had. So uh, that gives you a little bit of background. In terms of trade, what that means for us, I've done business development, I've done export controls, I've done trade policy, I was a lead for discussions with Mercosur at one point. Um, I have done negotiations in Washington. I was minister economic at the end of my time, which meant responsibility for trade policy and economic policy and commercial policy and business development. So quite a range and it was fascinating. And uh, here in Florida, what we do is basically we're at like a regional embassy. And I notice when I compare my job to that of other consuls general, we really do quite a range of things. And I can talk a little bit about that if you'd like, but uh, whereas some people are focused primarily on consular services, we do that and much more. Shall I talk a little bit about what we do or? Well, you can, you, you can for a minute or two, but we also have an economics agenda. And I know from the briefing notes that we had, so there's no secrets, one in five jobs in Florida depend on international trade. And I didn't know the extent of the relationship between Florida and Canada. So for me, getting into conversation with Susan and then her office changed this presentation. And I suspect, folks, you're in for a treat. So why don't you tell us where we're, where we're going to go and take us through the presentation. Well, what I usually like to do when I do this explanation I try to cover a little bit of the introduction. We've done most of that, but just to tell you what our Consulate General does. Then I talk about our footprint in Florida, and I start where David started on the security and defense side. Um, and then I focus on the commercial economic, about basically focusing on five different parameters. And then I go to the two hot economic issues of the day, which you probably could guess, but. I will make you guess. Please. <laughs> so shall I proceed Please with proceed. that? Please proceed, yeah. Um, we're one of 12, as I mentioned. I think it's useful for you to know the five elements that we focus on. Consular for us is uh, service to Canadians. We don't do visas, which some countries call a consular service. And I'll repeat that, we don't do visas because we get asked that a lot. But we do have an immigration counselor because obviously migration issues are important to us. We also have security and defense. We have uh, Canadian Armed Forces all over the state of Florida that link to us. And we have National Police and Customs in our office. We do commercial work, which is matchmaking. Their KPIs are related to do they help Canadian companies make deals. And then we have a little section that does all the rest, which is advocacy and academic relationships and culture and media. and so. Um, they're the ones who put the slideshow together. <laughs> so as I mentioned, we have Canadian Armed Forces all across the state. We also have the Mounties, no horse, just a, just a liaison officer, and uh, Customs, because we know that you can't have an economic relationship if you're not also taking care of business on the security and, uh, and defense side. Just a fun fact on that, um, up, you can see up in the panhandle, slightly displaced, of course, by Hurricane Michael, we have the NORAD people. 
NORAD is the Canada-US um, Continental Defense Group. And in fact, on 9-11, when the planes hit, um, a Canadian was the person in charge. And so he was the person responsible for the defense of US airspace. That's how close the relationship is. So not just in Normandy, but to the day now. And that, of course, will come back into the conversation. So the five parameters I like to use to talk about our economic footprint. Um, you'll notice it tells you about different locations here, almost 3,500. Well, that's because we have as Canadian companies TD Bank, Burger King, and Circle K, which have a lot of places. The numbers, and you're in this business, so you'll know, Dun & Bradstreet tells it's, it's almost 500 Canadian companies. We've had a number um, closer to 260. It all depends on defined business, defined Canadian, defined independent companies. But these are the locations and these are the companies. Um, and what I'll show you, I'll zip through this. This is Florida. We have a slide for um, the Tampa Bay area. And then we have a slide for, um, sorry. I thought I had another slide here for um, the Naples, Sarasota area because we also have information on that. Second parameter we like to look at is exports. And this is, if you'd like a copy of this, I can certainly leave it for you to, to have later. Um, exports, because that's also a second component that people like to measure. These are Florida exports to Canada. Obviously, trade is two-way, but usually people in Florida are more interested in this side of the equation. You can see, not surprisingly, where our exports are, um, are where the U.S. exports to Canada come from. And uh, we have the information both by county and by district because part of our job is to talk to congressional representatives. And every time I meet uh, a member of Congress, I can give him the sheet that tells him top five imports, top five exports, invest, and top ten Canadian investors in his district or her district. So it starts the conversation off well. Um, whoops. So here again, exports for the um, region here, um, Tampa Bay, and here's the, here are the figures from Sarasota to Naples. So you can see we have a breakdown here, but it, these are good numbers. Uh, I think you could see that these are good numbers. And reminder that exports are both services and, in, and goods. Third, three, third parameter we use are jobs because most people, that's what they can really see. And we use the figure 600,000 plus or minus 20,000. Again, it depends on the source of your statistics. And this is based on a number of about 43,000 direct employees, but with the multiplier effect because, of course, a, an employee then buys other services and goods. And so that's how we get the number of about 600,000 jobs in Florida directly attributable to the trade with Canada. Same uh, jobs in the two areas that we're looking at locally. Fourth parameter is tourism. And of course, most people, when they think of Canada or Florida, whether they're in Florida or in Canada, this is the number they think of. And it's true, it's a big number. Approximately 3.5 million visits. Now people don't know if that's me five times or five different people. But if, it's, uh, if, it is five, if it is each one an individual, we're talking about 3.5 million out of a Canadian population of 35 million. That's how important it is to Canada. And it is by far the largest source of international tourism here in Florida. The number two is the UK with about half that. So we matter to you, you matter to us. And if you're a person who looks at numbers, you've already probably Notice the percentages don't add up to 100. Well, that's because a lot of people to go to more than one place when they come to Florida. But uh, you can see a lot of people come for this area. And then the fifth parameter is one that I've discovered since I've been here in Florida. Never was one that came across my desk before because in a consular responsibility, you're much more regional and we deal with municipalities a lot. And it was real estate numbers. Not only are Canadians the number one purchaser of residential real estate, in Florida, we purchase about $4 billion of residential real estate, which uh, basically works out to half a billion dollars worth of property taxes every year. Now, obviously, 
you know how this works, we don't just keep adding four billion, we also sell. So we keep about, we estimate about a 15, $50 billion worth of residential real estate here in Florida, which is owned by Canadians. And that explains the close relationship I now have with Florida realtors who have an MOU with Canadian realtors and love us. <laughs> so they're very interested in this presentation too because this is a big deal in a state where real estate is this important. And for all sorts of reasons, Canadians usually buy in cash and it's usually a second home. So you can imagine the realtors love us. <laughs> um, and um, here again, these numbers locally. So when you put those five parameters together, now this I know is a little bit more detailed. Uh, this is a slide that originally came from the Florida Chamber of Commerce. They, of course, did not circle the Canadian flag. We did that part. Um, but what you see are these numbers put into um, context with the other international partners. You'll see that in the trade, we're either number two or number three. Um, so those are good numbers compared to the other international partners. Uh, you'll see the visitors are by far number one. And what most people don't usually understand is if you are selling to a foreigner, that is an export. So people sit at, standing here in Florida selling to Canadians are exporting a service. And that's counterintuitive. I know I used to work in services trade policy and we used to spend a lot of time trying to explain people uh, to people. And I think that's true of USF and others who sell their services to Canadian students too. That's an export. So congratulations on some of your exports. <laughs> um, and uh, you'll see that investment, it is indeed an important amount of investment because we're number two with the other four in the top five being from Europe. If you put all of those numbers together, according to the Florida Chamber figures, Canada is Florida's most important economic partner. And most people have no idea that that's the case. Um, partly, I think that's because, as I like to say, we pass invisible among you. Because <laughs> what, what does a Canadian look like? What does an American look like? We've got one of those. and. Um, so there are three tips that I've been giving to people. If you're on the East Coast and they're speaking French, pretty good chance they're Canadian, especially in the winter months. If they're standing in the ocean in January, <laughs> and if you go to a hockey game on either coast, you will recognize Canadians right away, and you will put to rest all those thoughts about peace-loving Canadians. <laughs> so you can identify Canadians, but we don't tend to speak up the same way. And I think that reflects the relationship that you've been describing, David, that we have foreigners, and then we have each other, and then we have our domestic partners. And it's true in Canada, too. We treat Americans and think about Americans differently, and that's my experience here in Florida. You think about Canadians slightly differently than other foreigners, so people just aren't aware. People are aware, of course, of the China issues. And so another fun fact, although geopolitically, I think there's no denying that Ch China is in a different category than Canada, despite our G7 uh, participation. The reality is that the US exports more goods to Canada than it exports to China, plus Japan, plus the UK. Export more goods to Canada than the three other countries that I just named. That's how important we are as a market for your products. So it's a very important relationship. And you can understand that if I start with this, then we have a different kind of conversation when we get down to talking about business. Um, shall I go into the two issues, or do you want to well, have uh, a chance for you to speak a little bit more? Uh, uh, just a quick interruption. How many people in the room are Florida residents or at least during the year, prolonged visitors? Thank you. How many people in the room in the last 10 minutes learned something new that they didn't know before? Oh, <laughs> my job is done. <laughs> Or started, anyway. <laughs> so when you think about the conversation 
about tariffs, trade, and all the flow of news, there's a different perspective when this kind of information is in front of you. I'm going to get to a specific one. We've heard a little bit about steel and aluminum, <laughs> tariffs, protectionism. Um, can you say a word or two about that? I would uh, love to. <laughs> First of all, Canadians find it insulting to be considered in any way a national security risk to Americans, given our history, given our current situation. So it, people, you know, we're Canadian, we're hurt by this. <laughs> and um, it's interesting, the reaction, because some of the other things that are going on have not affected Canadians quite to the same extent. But first of all, people are hurt by it, but secondly, we consider it an illegal application of tariffs. It's an illegal tax, and though therefore have retaliated in equal amount. This has been very bad for U.S. business. Obviously, it's bad for Canadian business, but it's been bad for U.S. business, and now we're seeing some of the implications. Um, the downside of this, number one, uh, what you're doing is, in fact, setting in uh, place a process where each country can ask for exemptions. And for example, on the steel tariffs, which are 25%, it's a large tariff and a largely tariff-free relationship, approximately 40% of the applications from China have, China have been granted, opposed to 2% of the Canadian applications. And on aluminum, which is only a 10%, it's worse, it's 85% of the China applications have been uh, granted and about 0.2 percent of the Canadians. So, when you say application, you mean waiver. That's right. Applications yeah. for exemptions. So, if you know, because what is the objective of this tariff? Um, if it's to keep out Chinese steel and aluminum, which is one of the reasons that's been put forward, it doesn't seem to be working on that front. Secondly, what we're seeing is. Uh, supply chains are being changed and the sourcing is coming from other countries. Obviously, Canada, Mexico and the EU, which are all affected by these tariffs, are not the same source of steel and aluminum, but other countries like Poland and Singapore and other countries are because the, it's not that you can't just start up a steel plant immediately, so you're getting disrupted supply chains and new players, but it's not like all of the US steel is sort of popped into place. And third, what we're seeing is US companies who are in the transformative industries, a lot of the companies who take the steel and turn it into something else where there are more jobs, more value added, um, they're being penalized because if they source from a source of steel that has a 25% tariff, and they're competing with company X from country Y that doesn't have that penalty, well, the other company has a price advantage. So uh, that's why the Manufacturers Association of Florida is, has come out very vocally against these tariffs. It's very hard on both the large and small and medium-sized companies that they represent. So we think it's a bad situation that's easily resolvable. You put down your tariffs and we'll put down ours. <laughs> Tariffs. <laughs> tariffs, protectionism, trade agreements, NAFTA, new NAFTA, USMCA. Where are we? What's happening? Where is this going? How do you see it? Um, when I came into this job in the summer of 2016, I was I was, like many Canadians, quite surprised. We used to say that we agreed with the Republicans on trade and economic issues and the Democrats on social issues. And we found ourselves in a situation where both sides se seemed to be shooting at trade. So we were, quite a, we were quite surprised by that, especially we're very dependent, like Florida is specifically. About one in five jobs depends on trade. And clearly the US is by far our most important economic partner. So uh, when there was talk of getting rid of NAFTA, well, the reality is we 
consider that in the 25 years it's been in existence, it's actually been renegotiated about 11 times on an incremental basis. I know that I've worked on working groups, NAPTA working groups, um, that have updated different areas. We also know, and I don't think this is a secret, that in our TPP negotiations, which include the Pacific Alliance from Latin America and the Asian countries, all three NAFTA partners were at the table. So de facto, we were negotiating. So we had, and the way those things go, you do a lot of research. So we were all pretty aware of where the issues were, what the other people wanted, where things were gonna go. So it wasn't a big surprise, and we certainly recognized that a 25-year-old agreement was due for an update. The best line on that I heard is, uh, 25 years ago, that's when Amazon was just a river. And you think, you think of the changes that we have had in these years, of course it makes sense to update it. We didn't always appreciate the way this was being brought to the table, but we worked through things. We feel that at the end of the negotiations, we've come up with a pretty solid agreement, and it was signed by all three parties um, at the end of September last year. From our point of view, negotiations are finished, the next step after you finish negotiations is you have to go to your respective legislative bodies. So uh, that's before the parliament in, um, in Canada, in the legislature assembly in Mexico, and that means we have the opportunity to take this to get bipartisan support on the Hill in Washington. We're looking forward to that, of course. Um, one thing I would mention that uh, the 232, the steel and aluminum, uh, issue is uh, starting to make a little bit of a, of a discussion in Ottawa because most people feel like if we are this good a trade partner to have NAFTA, we should not have this kind of 232 steel and aluminum tariff-based uh, issue thrown into the middle. It, as I said, we consider it both offensive and illegal, and we think we should get rid of it. But um, that could affect the parliamentary um, uh, acceptance of the agreement. And we do have an election ourselves this October, so that's not a small issue. But we believe that it's a good agreement. We, we call it in Canada the CUSMA. You call it the USMCA. <laughs> but wherever, whatever country you start your initials with, uh, we do think that this is a better agreement. It includes, and I can talk a little bit if Please. you'd like. Um, we, uh, we like that, for example, labor and environment, they are now chapters, not side agreements. They're subject to dispute settlement, which we, we believe in a trade agreement is important. It's not enough to have obligations. You have to be able to enforce it, and that's why we are very public in our desire to keep a dispute settlement mechanism in NAFTA. We believe um, on the, what I would call the progressive side, that we needed to do more, and we also had some agendas in Canada along those lines. We've had a gender equity-ish um, uh, chapter with our Chilean colleagues in our agreement for some time now. We've updated it. We were looking at elements like that, but also small business. It was important for us to have a small business chapter, which we have. Um, we have a digital economy chapter. We have... Um, some other aspects, uh, the things that come up here in Florida the most, what are, what are people really looking for for NAFTA? Number one, stability, predictability, stop disrupting the supply chains, let's get on with business. And if I talk about supply chains, I always like to show this slide because we build things together. If I were in Michigan, I'd be showing a car, but I'm in an agricultural state, so and it's after lunch, so I'll show you that we build things together, whether it's an agricultural product or not. That kind of stability is important, and we think that it has, um, it's important to have that kind of context so business can get on with business and not have to worry about the framework. We have a regulatory cooperation chapter because we found that that's where, when you're into a practically tariff-free area, it's the non-tariff barriers that become important. So regulatory cooperation, we don't always say harmonization, but that gives you a sense of what we're looking for. So you get rid of the unnecessary differences in regulatory. Uh, these are all aspects of the new agreement. So that's, we're hoping, it's now been 
in uh, House Ways and Means. We're starting to talk to congressional representatives about it, but most of them are still saying it's not quite on their agendas yet. But uh, we think it should be coming up. We're waiting for a report from the ITC in Washington where they do an evaluation of the new agreement. And as I said, then we have the pleasure of going on the Hill to seek that bipartisan agreement for the USMCA. Can you shed uh, a little light on the politics on the Canadian side, because that's something we don't see in our media. We see ample points of view here. But maybe you can give us a two-minute window into what it looks like on the other side of the board. Well, um, we have a parliamentary government, and it's basically one chamber because our Senate is appointed. Where we have the checks and balances is provincial and federal. So we went from small C and capital C conservative government to a small L, capital L government with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. And then most of the provinces have gone conservative because that's how Canadians like to keep a balance on things. So things uh, have to uh, work out between two. The politics there, as you can imagine, isn't always easy um, because you're talking about philosophical differences as well as party differences, but most Canadian governments recognize the fundamental priority of a, a stable relationship with our largest trading partner, given how dependent we are on trade. It's in the details, of course, that people have some issues, and yes, we have some issues in Canada, but in general, as it needs to go through the parliamentary system and going through the negotiations, we had a tight connection with provincial and territorial governments and business and NGOs when the negotiators came to the signing part. They knew that they had the authority they needed because, as you can guess, some of the responsibilities for some of the areas where people want to have that free trade uh, context are actually responsibilities of provincial governments. So it only goes through the Canadian Parliament, but the provinces have to be basically on side. And they are. However, you know what it's like going into an election period. And as I said, uh, there are people who are taking it very hard that the idea of a, of a big tariff being introduced on the basis of us being a national security threat to the, to the US. So in a parliamentary system, if you have a majority government, when you take the vote and you have a party whip, you're pretty sure that things will go through. The issue I think that's been identified right now is this growing concern by Canadians in a pre-electoral period about this steel and aluminum tariff. And let me put that into context. With this kind of a $700 billion a year trading relationship, we do have other trade files where tariffs are levied. The infamous softwood lumber, and no, I don't really want to talk about that. I, it's not a file anybody loves. <laughs> um, but we do have these tariff discussions. That you might have heard about newsprint that affected the Tampa Bay Times, for example, or the Boeing Bombardier case. The 232, the steel and aluminum tariffs, because it's been invoked on the basis of this national security threat label, is the most political tariff that I have, that I have seen. And that seems to be the only issue right now that puts into jeopardy from what I can see and what we in the network are identifying at this point um, is the only real threat to getting the sign off in Canada of the new agreement. We have two, three minutes left. Mm -hmm. Would you venture a forecast on both sides of the border and a timetable <laughs> that you might expect. Um, You're prepared, you can hedge any way you want. Well, so you're asking me, a Canadian, to predict when a bipartisan bill will go through the U.S. Congress? Well, it's got it, it's got it. It's got it. Well, based on my, on my expertise. The, the last Consul General I asked this question said, Is 20, that a job 20, <laughs> well, they said 2037 or sooner. So. Well, I, I'm glad to sign on to that prediction. Um, it's 
to me, in Florida, for a trade-based economy, I'm always surprised how little people here think about trade. When I have been in meetings on trade, people don't think of the state as being as dependent on trade as it is. And that does not bode well for an issue getting through a, a tense situation in Congress. One of our major allies has, of course, been the agricultural sector because they are paying heavily in the US for the trade wars, not just with us, but with, with China. And that is a group from my five years in Washington that has a lot of influence in Washington. Agricultural sector is the most sensitive sector, not just because of the importance economically, but because it re represents the rural, the cultural. There's a lot there, so they are very influential, and they are very big supporters of the new agreement. They want the stability. And I think it comes down to the degree to which uh, Americans, and especially American business, say they want stability. There's not, NAFTA could be settled. We could get that out of the way. Now, of course, when we, prior to the end of negotiations, we had a lot more Democratic support and a lot less Republican support, and now it's sort of changed. Um, we believe this agreement is, is an agreement that it warrants the support of both parties because there are the issues. We have a party that's more like Democrats in many ways, but as I said, we think our trade is like the Republican trade issue. So we think we have a good agreement to get that agree, to get that support on the Hill. But it's very difficult to predict where that will go and how high a priority it is. And what the president could use as leverage if he wanted to get it to go through. And that's a little difficult to predict. So I would say on the Canadian side, if the tariffs were taken off steel and aluminum, it would go through quickly. That's the only real obstacle. Um, it probably would go through anyway, but it's not sure because this is, this is, as you know, when you touch emotions, it's more than just the economic aspect, and that is an issue that has that. So that, that reality means I would predict there's a greater than 50-50 chance it would go through Canada before the election in October. We're all waiting to see what Mexico does because that has been one of the big issues for the Democrats and they're not my area of expertise, but um, I think there is greater than 50-50 chance that it would get through in this presidential term through the US Congress, through in this Congress, but I don't know. But that's about as far, and that's even crystal balling it a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, the Consul General of Canada. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to be with us a while. Yes.